troops know this. And I'd like to take just another moment of your time today, Mr. Chairman, to end where I began this morning with our troops and the thousands of American and coalition partner troops that are bearing the weight of this conflict. And those we'll break away here with the House returning and taking up a couple of bills dealing with federal property. Mr. Live Speaker, coverage. Uh, by direction of the Committee on Rules, I call up House Resolution 587 and ask for its immediate consideration. The clerk will report the resolution. House Calendar Number 118, House Resolution 587, resolved that at any time after the adoption of this resolution, the Speaker may, pursuant to Clause 2B of Rule 18, declare the House resolved into the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union for consideration of the bill, H.R. 2087, to remove restrictions from a parcel of land situated in the Atlantic District, Accomack County, Virginia. The first reading of the bill shall be dispensed with. All points of order against consideration of the bill are waived. General debate shall be confined to the bill and shall not exceed one hour equally divided and controlled by the chair and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources. After general debate, the bill shall be considered for amendment under the five-minute rule. It shall be in order to consider as, as an original bill for the purpose of amendment under the five-minute rule, the amendment in the nature of a substitute recommended by the Committee on Natural Resources now printed in the bill. The committee amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be considered as read. All points of order against the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute are waived. No amendment to the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute shall be in order, except those received for printing in the portion of the congressional record designated for that purpose in Clause 8 of Rule 18 in a daily issue dated March 19, 2012, and accept pro forma amendments for the purpose of debate. Each amendment so received may be offered only by the member who caused it to be printed or a designee and shall be considered as read if printed. At the conclusion of consideration of the bill for amendment, the committee shall rise and report the bill to the House with such amendments as may have been adopted. Any member may demand a separate vote in the House on any amendment adopted in the committee of the whole to the bill or to the committee amendment in the nature of a substitute. The previous question shall be considered as ordered on the bill and amendments thereto to final passage without intervening motion except one motion to recommit with or without instructions. For what purpose does the gentleman from Arizona rise? Mr. Speaker, this proposed rule seeks to waive House rules requ requiring disclosure of any earmark in the bill, H.R. 2087. Therefore, pursuant to Clause 9, of Rule 21 of, of the Rules of the House, I make a point of order against consideration of this rule. The gentleman from Arizona makes a point of order that the resolution violates Clause 9B of Rule 21. Under Clause 9B of Rule 21, the gentleman from Arizona and the gentleman from Utah each will control 10 minutes of debate on the question of consideration. Following the debate, the chair will put the question of consideration as follows. Will the House now consider the resolution? The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the majority frequently congratulates itself for adopting a policy banning earmarks. Republican leadership often points to the earmark ban as an important accomplishment in improving the legislative process should be noted for the record the provision requiring disclosure of earmarks was inserted into the rules of the House during the 110th Congress under a Democratic majority. The American people might be surprised to learn that despite claims of strict opposition to earmarks, the majority is bringing a proposed rule to the House floor that would not only allow an earmark in the underlying bill, but even waives the basic requirement that such an earmark be disclosed. Clause 9 of Rule 21 of the rules of the House specifically states that it shall not be in order to consider a rule that waives the requirement to disclose earmarks. And yet the rule the majority is seeking to call up specifically states all points of order against consideration of this bill are waived. And the question of whether the underlying bill, H.R. 2087, contains an earmark is critical. If enacted, the bill would transfer full ownership of federal land to a county in Virginia. All parties agree the land has an appraised value of $815,000.
but the bill would transfer this federal land to the county for free. The county is in the congressional district represented by the sponsor of the legislation. This is not county land. This is federal land. The county has been granted limited authority to control this land as long as it is used for public recreation. According to the deed, the county cannot sell the land or rent it or lease it or develop it. Only H.R. 2087 will give the county this land with no limitation. I suspect that every member of this House would like to be able to pass legis legislation giving his or her constituents an $815,000 windfall. Mr. Speaker, either this is an earmark and the, ma and the majority should follow its own rules and not bring this rule, or the, uh, or the underlining bill to the floor, or this is not an earmark and the waiver should be removed from the rule. Either way, the proposed rule is a clear violation of House rules and should not be taken up by this House. And I reserve, Mr. Chairman, the balance of my time. The gentleman from Arizona reserves. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I claim the time, obviously, in favor of consideration of this resolution. The question before the House is, should the House now consider House Resolution 587? While the resolution waives all points of order against consideration of the bill, the committee is not aware of any point of order. The waiver is a complete waiver in nature. Note, there is not a specific waiver against an earmark simply because the bill contains no earmarks. It is in compliance with the earmark definition provided for us in the House rules, a rule that goes back actually to make the record complete to the 109th session of Congress. And the earmark ban instituted by the House Republicans when they took majority in January of last year. As is required by House rules, the committee report filed for this bill on January 18th includes specific determination and statements that the bill does not contain an earmark. I will quote from page five of the report. The bill does not contain any congressional earmarks or limited tax benefits or limited tar tariff benefits as defined by the rules of the House of Representatives. With all due respect to my friend from Arizona, each person may have their own perception of what an earmark is, but with all due respect, the term congressional earmark means a provision that provides or authorizes or recommends a specific amount of discretionary budget authority, credit authority, or other spending authority, or expenditures with or to an entity that has to have money involved in it. Specifically, the definition of an earmark requires that there be spending in the form directed to an entity or targeted geographically. This bill does not involve spending of money or loan authority or credit authority or any other form of payment of funds. The land in question is, is already with the county. It will remain with the county. Whether we pass this bill or not, it is still with the county. The only issue is the deed restriction not the value of the land, not transfer of money. This parcel is with Virginia on federal land that at one time had a deed restriction. It simply removes that deal. The CBO viewed and scored this bill and concluded it would not cost money, stating it would have no significant impact on the federal budget. Moreover, this type of bill clearing the title to land has repeatedly been approved when the House has been controlled by both Republicans and Democrats. Definition of an earmark is clear. There has not been a physical impact. And this bill does not meet the House rules definition used by either Democrats or Republicans. This is really a red herring to stop economic development, creation of jobs caused by lingering federal bureaucratic red tape. This county is one of the poorest counties in the Commonwealth of Virginia more than 16 percent of its population living in poverty and a higher rate of unemployment than the rest of Virginia, this very small bill at no cost to the federal taxpayer will help to turn that around. With that, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves the gentleman from Arizona. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Under current law, the, the county controls these 32 acres of federal land but the deed clearly states that the county may not sell or lease the land or use it for anything other than public recreation. The county received control of the land with those restrictions in 1976, free of charge. The underlining bill, H.R. 2087, will remove all restrictions from the deed. 
the county would be free to sell the land or lease it or do whatever they want with it and pocket any and all revenue. This is clearly $815,000 windfall for the county created specifically by this bill. Regardless of whether you agree the bill is an earmark, the proposal from the Rules Committee to waive the earmark disclosure rule should also be cause for concern. If H.R. 2087 contains no earmarks, why is the waiver necessary? Why have an earmark disclosure rule if you just waive it every time you bring a bill to the floor? Any member who, who has ever claimed to oppose earmarks should insist that the rule waiving the disclosure requirement be rejected. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Arizona reserves. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Mr. Speaker, once again, the rule does not waive an earmark because there are no earmarks. It is a general waiver that is in there. And if one were to look back at the past three Congresses, official bills that are, have been prepared that are very similar to this have also concluded the same type of language and were determined as not to have an earmark. Specifically, go back to H H.R. 944 in the 112th Congress, H.R. 86 in the 111th Congress, H.R. 356 in the 110th Congress, H.R. 2246 in the 110th Congress, and S. 404 in the 112th Congress. Same language, same situation, same condition. Once again, the rules of our House say this is not an earmark. CBO says it's not an earmark because it is not an earmark. There is no transfer of money. The county has the land. The county will continue to have the land. The only thing this is about is the deed restriction. Deed restrictions are not earmarks. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, reading from uh, the remarks to the Natural Resources Subcommittee uh, Thursday, September 15th, by the sponsor uh, of this legislation, uh, he stated a recent appraisal valued the land at 815,000, which is more than 25,000 per acre. There is there is economic gain for the county, and waiving uh, the disclosure only adds to the confusion that the public feels when we, we say we have a ban on earmarks and yet we are waiving rules that would disclose that and fully be transparent as to the kinds of decisions we're making with public lands. If CBO is unable to value what public land is worth, it's certainly here in the testimony of the sponsor of this legislation, the appraisal value is listed and that to me leads to the conclusion that this is an earmark and the rule uh, that is presently before us uh, should be rejected. And I yield back. Uh, the gentleman from Arizona yields back his time. Uh, the gentleman from Utah is recognized. Let me try and once again put this in perspective. Federal government in of itself owns no land, especially in one of the original 13 states. Virginia had the land and gave it to the federal government. In 1976, the federal government gave this back to the county with a lease for a park and restrictions, a deed restriction only. There is no transfer of money if we take away the deed restriction. There's no transfer of authority. The county has it, the county will continue to have it. The dollar value that was given was made up in the minds of the Department of Interior. This county actually said, if you really want more parkland, we will create 32 acres somewhere else for more parkland. And the Department of Interior said, no, let's have cash instead. They are the ones that determined that this land was worth 25 grand an acre, asking almost a million dollars from one of the poorest counties. They came up with that on their own. That does not mean it's reality. The reality is the county has the land, the county will continue to have the land, there is no transfer of dollars, there is no loss from taxpayers in America, and actually these guys who live in Virginia are taxpayers too. Transferring from one pocket to the other is a ridiculous requirement to place on them and all we're talking about is a deed restriction. How can we best use the land to actually help people? Now if the other side does not care about this county, does not care about the 16% of the population living in poverty, does not care about the unemployment rate, does not care that they actually use this land in a logical, rational manner, I can understand that. It still doesn't mean that's an earmark. Point of order is a delay tactic of today's consideration of this legislation. Sometimes in the past, a couple of other members who have declared what I think are earmarks as non-earmarks 
have always used the old cliche, if it, talk, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. But as Hans Christian Andersen told us, sometimes those ducks you perceive are actually the honking of a swan. This bill is a swan. This bill will help these people to produce themselves. This point of order has no merit to it. In order to allow the House to continue its scheduled business of the day, I urge members to vote yes on the question of consideration of this resolution, and I, yield, I also yield back my time. All time for debate has expired. The question is, will the House now consider the resolution? Those in favor, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, say no. In the opinion of the chair, the ayes have it. The question of consideration is decided in the Mr. affirmative. Mr. Speaker, on that I ask for a recorded vote. Does the gentleman ask for the yeas and nays? Please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The yeas and nays are requested. Those favoring a vote by the yeas and nays will rise. A sufficient number having risen, the yeas and nays are ordered. Members will record their votes by electronic device, and this is a 15-minute vote. The House today taking up two bills dealing with federal property. The one earlier today they debated establishes a pilot program for the uh, expedited sale of federal real estate. And before they consider the uh, next un underlying bill, the uh, ahead of the vote on the uh, debate on the rule for that, that bill would be uh, one that removes restrictions on a uh, parcel of land in Accomack County, Virginia. Ahead of that, though, Democrats have raised a point of order against the rule, saying that the rule waives a, a House ban on earmarks in the underlying bill. And um, the Republicans there in the debate saying there are no earmarks in the bill, and thus the vote is on a question of consideration. Will the House consider uh, the rule for this bill today? This is a 15-minute vote and the only one in this series. In this series. Earlier today, uh, Representative Paul Ryan, the chairman of the uh, House Budget Committee, unveiled the fiscal year 2013 budget plan. We've linked to that on our website, cspan.org. And during this vote, we'll get a chance to show you the news conference this morning and the questions from reporters. Morning, everybody. It's a good day. I'm proud to be here with my fellow colleagues on the House Budget Committee. They've worked very hard, we have together, to produce this document that we are all holding on our hands, the path to prosperity. I'm also grateful for Senator Jeff Sessions, who is here with us, who is the ranking member of the Senate Budget Committee, who brings a prosecutorial zeal to the budget that has gotten out of control. One year ago, we offered our path to prosperity, and this year, we are offering again our path to prosperity. This year, we're going to build on the important work that we did last year. We're going to take several new and improved strides. First, we propose that we repeal the President's disastrous health care law. It stops the law's mandates from trampling on our liberties. It stops its spending from threatening our physical health. And it stops this board of bureaucrats from threatening Medicare. Instead, we propose to save and strengthen Medicare by taking power away from government bureaucrats. We preserve the Medicare guarantee for today's seniors so they can count on the benefit that they've organized their retirement around. And we preserve that guarantee going into the future for tomorrow's seniors by empowering them with choices, including a fee-for-service traditional op option within a premium support system. We believe competition and choice should be the way forward versus price controls that lead to rationing. On the budget, we also propose to strengthen Medicaid by empowering our states, by returning money to them so that they can design programs that are unique to their states to tailor this program to meet the needs of their populations. We also reform welfare. The 1996 welfare reform was very successful in getting toward an upward mobile society and getting people off of dependency and on to lives of self-sufficiency. Yet unfortunately, that was the only program among the means-tested entitlement programs that was reformed and we're proposing similar reforms to the states so that we can make sure that we're not creating a culture of dependency in America 
but a culture of self-sufficiency, of getting people back on their feet in the lives of upward mobility. We also propose, as one of our hallmark issues to get to economic growth and job creation, to reform the tax system. Specifically, we include in here a tax reform proposal provided to us by all of the members of the Ways and Means Committee. We propose to collapse the six different tax brackets into two rates, a 10% bracket and a 25% bracket for individuals, and a 25% bracket for corporations, which is at the international average, and going to a territorial system. All those kinds of specs and details you can get on the website that shows the letter that we've been given by the Ways and Means Committee. Finally, I would say something about what's coming this next year. The sequester is coming. And a lot of people in Washington would like to simply ignore this. A lot of people in Washington would like to simply think that we can spend as we're going and ignore the fact that on January 2nd, the sequester kicks in. We don't think we should ignore this. And so what we're doing in this budget this year is something we haven't done for six years. We're going to propose to go through a reconciliation process. Now, you might be thinking, well, they used reconciliation a couple of years ago. They distorted the reconciliation process to jam through a new partisan health care entitlement. We're going to bring reconciliation back to what it was meant to do, which is to get spending and deficits under control. We're instructing six authorizing committees to bring their spending cuts to the budget committee and then therefore to the floor by May so we can show how we would replace next year's sequester. We think that that is extremely important to show the country exactly how we would prepare for these, these eventualities. Now, I think it's also critical to, re to reiterate the several challenges that are facing our country. And I want to bring everybody's attention to these charts. Well, this thing actually works. <laughs> now, we've had deficits in the past. We've had, for a brief moment, surpluses, but we've had deficits. Look at where our country is headed. Look at where the president and his budget is taking the country. The president's budget is putting us on a path of a debt crisis, of decline, and these are the deficits that are in store for America if we stay with the status quo. Here is what the path of prosperity proposes. We propose to get our budget on a sustainable path. We propose to get our budget not only on a path to balance, but onto paying off the debt on a path to prosperity. And if we actually start growing the economy faster, which we think our policies will result in, then the budget would balance even faster than it is shown right here. Let's talk about spending. The president keeps the size of government at historic highs now and well into the future. He never brings spending back down to where it historically has been. By 2015, we get spending down to 20% of the economy, which is our historic average, and then below that after that. All in all, what we're proposing here is to cut $5.3 trillion in spending from the president's budget. This results in at least $3.3 trillion in deficit reduction compared to the president's budget. Now, here is really what it all matters to. And that is, what about the national debt? We know in front of us is one of the most predictable crises we've ever had in this country's history, a mountain of debt that is coming. This is what the Congressional Budget Office is telling us our future is going to look like. This is the future that the president's plan of debt and decline brings us to. This is what the Senate gets you by doing nothing, by not passing a budget for three years in a row. This is a future that gives our children a diminished country. This is a future that ruins our economy. This is a future that we don't want to see happening. And so if we have a difference of opinion with the president, the direction he and the Senate leaders have taken the country, which we do, we feel morally bound to offer a choice. And we have a legal obligation in our budget laws to produce a budget. And so what our budget does is it shows precisely how we will get this budget under control and get our debt levels under control. At the end of the day, it's all about growth. It's about growing opportunities. It's about growing the economy. It's about lifting the debt, restoring economic freedom, reforming the tax code so that we can help have our economy reach its full potential. It's about turning our system that has become a dependent culture into an upward mobile society, getting people back on the lives of self-sufficiency. And if our economy grows even faster than what we produce here, the results are all that much better. Before I close, I'd like to thank my colleagues on the Budget Committee for all the hard work we've put together in putting this budget together. I want to thank Senator Jeff Sessions for his leadership over in the Senate. I'm hoping to call him chairman next year. 
And I, at its core, I want to basically say this. This plan of action is about putting an end to empty promises from bankrupt government and restoring the fundamental promise of America, ensuring that our children have more opportunity than we do. That's the American idea. Leave your children better off. We know for the first time in the history of this country that that legacy will be severed unless we act. And if we step in and fix this problem now, we can avoid a very painful debt crisis tomorrow. We are here to offer Americans the chance to choose which future they want for themselves. The president's path of debt in decline or the path that we're proposing, a path to renew prosperity for Americans. And with that, let me turn it over to Senator Sessions. The House Republicans were elected to a new majority, and they have courageously, intelligently, and responsibly laid out a new plan for America's future. Uh, they've met their duty that they were sent here to fulfill. We have never needed a budget more than we need it today. We are facing a systemic threat to America's financial health. The budget that they've offered will alter the debt course from unsustainable to sustainable. It will take us from decline to prosperity. It is the right thing for America. The Senate Democrats have abandoned their obligations and have refused to offer a budget for three straight years now. They didn't bother to write one last year, and they're going to miss the April 1st deadline this year, and they're not going to produce one this year. Senator Harry Reid, the Democratic leader, said it would be foolish to have a budget. The Senate's Democratic majority has forfeited their claim to leadership for America. If, if the voters give the Republicans in the Senate the honor of having the majority and the leadership, we will work with the House to pass a congressional budget. It will be an honest budget. It will change the debt course of America. Thank you, Paul, and all of you for the great work and the leadership you've provided. Thanks, so much. Questions? Chairman Ryan, can you talk for a minute? You know, the Democrats are already in full force portraying this as this is Medicare again last year. Just a few minutes ago, John Morrison, the chair of the Democratic caucus, said this is deja vu all over again. We look at this, this concrete plan here. Most people aren't going to sit down and read this. Most people aren't going to sit down Come and read this. Go to www.budget.gov and you can download this yourself. Yeah, that's, that's, but most people are going to see a 30 second ad. Most people are going to hear a quick sound bite and they're going to say, oh my gosh, they want to cut Medicare. How can you, how can you defend? How can you argue right. against that and win that argument? Here's what I would simply say if we simply operate based on political fear, nothing's ever going to get done. If we allow entitlement politics, fear that your adversaries will turn your reforms into a political weapon to use against you, and we cow to that, then America's going to have a debt crisis. I've got news. Medicare, under the president's law, is going bankrupt. Medicare, under the president's law, is next year turning Medicare over to a board of 15 unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats whose job is to circumvent Congress and put price controls on Medicare, which will lead to denied care for current seniors. Medicare, under the president's law, raids a half a trillion dollars from Medicare to spend on his new health care proposal. We're saying get rid of the rationing board, stop the raid, and preserve the system. Don't change benefits for people in a near retirement because they've already retired or they're about to retire, and they've organized their lives around this program. And we're saying let people in the future, in order to save this system, have a list of choices of guaranteed options, including the traditional fever service program, who wants to choose, just like we do as members of Congress, for our health care choices. Saving Medicare this way, which has a rich tradition of bipartisan support for this kind of Medicare reform, is the most humane, the most common sense and bipartisan way to save this vital program. But let me, let me turn it over to Dr. Price who is an expert on this, who is a member of the Ways and Means Committee as well, to give you more respect. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Chad, the, the, the American people are smarter than the Democrats give them credit for. Uh, they understand that this program, the current program, uh, is, is broken. They understand that what the President has done with his, with, with his party is, as the Chairman said, removed $500 billion from the current program. 
in the current Medicare program. They understand that what the President's plan is, with, through his law currently, is to put in place the Independent Payment Advisory Board that is a board of 15 unelected bureaucrats who have the power, without appeal, to deny payment for services for seniors. The American people understand this. They know that what we've been working on is strengthening and improving and saving the Medicare system, which is why the work that was done between last year and this year allows seniors, would allow, will allow seniors the opportunity to stay on the current Medicare program if, if that's what they desire or to voluntarily move to a different program through a premium support process. So the American people are brighter than the Democrats give them credit but for. Briefly, if I can follow up, I mean, there, there are some on the, on the other side of the aisle. You, you described this, Mr. Chairman, as a rationing board. There are some, you know, we've heard it portrayed in the worst form as a death panel. I mean, again, are people going to say that this is just another set shot of political rhetoric? Go ahead. That, look, let, let's, let's, let's be clear. The Independent Payment Advisory Board is a board that is, is in current law that will be 15 individuals appointed by the president who without appeal will be able to deny payment for services that doctors would provide to seniors. As a physician, I can tell you that when you talk to the, to the doctors of this land and say, if you don't get paid for something, are you able to do it? And the answer is no. And so what happens is that care is denied to seniors. So it doesn't make any difference what you call it. The fact of the matter is the board is in place that will deny payment for services to seniors. Seniors know that's wrong. That's why we are working to improve and strengthen the program. Chairman Ryan. Chairman Ryan. Um, one thing we all know that Americans are very tired of is government shutdown fights. Um, what do you say to Democrats who say budget levels, uh, spending levels were already agreed to with the debt deal over the summer, and with this budget, you're picking another government shutdown fight? I wouldn't say that at all. I'd say we have to prepare for the fact that on January 2nd, discretionary spending goes down to 950. We have to say that we're preparing and we're showing how we would preempt the sequester from hitting next year. We shouldn't be going down the path knowing that once we pass appropriations in October, that after October, November, December, then bam, a sequester hits in. We need to prepare for that. And what we're doing in this budget is we're showing how we would prepare for that. We're actually going to reconcile six committees. We're going to make six committees go out and come up with spending cuts to show how we would replace the sequester. We think it's just being honest with people. We think it's being forthright about how we think we should deal with what's coming instead of just ignoring the law and pretending as if nothing's going to happen in January. Chairman Ryan, Chairman Ryan, do you feel that this budget... Luke, Luke got you there, sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey, look, you guys can settle this later. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel that this budget could have a detrimental effect to the GOP presidential nominee in November? No, I really don't. I think all, all of the, our candidates have campaigned on these various ideas. Our nominee owes it to the country to give them a choice of two futures. We're helping him do that. Look, the president is giving us a path of debt and decline. The president just gave us his fourth budget with a fourth trillion dollar deficit with a fourth time of kicking the can and ignoring the drivers of our debt. And actually, it's worse than that because the president's making it worse. He's putting more taxes on the back of taxpayers, on the back of hardworking Americans, on the back of small businesses, and he's increasing spending. So we owe the country an alternative path if we don't like the path the president's taking us on. Whoever our nominee is going to be owes the country that choice of two futures. We're helping them put this together. And each of these people running for president have all given their various ideas and reforms with perfectly jive and consistent with what we're proposing. And you wholeheartedly believe they will accept your budget? Absolutely. In I'm confident in that. Yeah. Um, what is the, the cost of your tax proposals over uh, the next decade? And specifically, how do you pay for them, offset them, so you're not right. adding to the deficit? Right. So we propose revenue neutral tax reform. <coughs> how do you do that? We believe that there's an emerging bipartisan consensus, just like there is in Medicare on tax reform. The only problem with this consensus is the president and the Senate Democrats aren't part of it. The president just gave us a budget that says raise tax rates and add more loopholes to the tax code. More complexity, higher tax rates, it leads to more cronyism and less economic growth. We're saying keep the revenue baseline as it is, but replace this tax code we have, which is extremely complex. It's the result of both political parties loading up the tax code with special interest loopholes we're saying get rid of the tax shelters, get rid of the loopholes, lower tax rates for everybody. And the one part I would simply talk about is this. Eight out of ten businesses in America 
they're not corporations. They're small businesses. They file their taxes as individuals, as subchapter S's, as LLCs. The president is saying in January he wants their top effective tax rate to go to 44.8 percent. Well, where I come from overseas, which we mean Lake Superior, <laughs> the Canadians just lowered their tax rate on their businesses to 15 percent. How on earth, in a state where nine out of ten of our businesses file their taxes as individuals, can we compete when we're taxing them at 45 percent and the Canadians are at 15? The point I'm trying to make is get rid of the tax shelters, lower everybody's tax rates so we can get faster economic growth. And you can do that in a revenue-neutral way by cleaning up the loopholes in the tax shelters. Which ones? That's what the Ways and Means Committee is in charge of doing. And what the Ways and Means Committee wants to do, what Chairman Camp will tell you, is let's do this out front, in plain sight, with the public in view, and not in some back room. But, but help me out, what is the potential revenue loss? Uh, we don't propose a revenue loss. We propose the current policy baseline, yeah. which is what the CBO uses to show where revenues are under the code as we know it today. We do not assume a massive tax increase. We do not assume the $4.4 .4 trillion tax increase that the current law has in store or the big $2 trillion tax increase that President Obama has in his budget. We propose not to raise taxes. We propose to get tax revenues the same amount from Americans, not by picking winners and losers in Washington, but by treating everybody fairly and simply so we can have a more competitive tax system. Lori. Right. Question. Um, on the, the tax code, to get 25 percent, don't you have to get rid of pretty much everything? Mortgage deduction, employer health care, retirement not savings, and the second question is, where do you get 1.8 trillion over the decade in other mandatories? What is that? So, when you look at the 1.8 trillion, you have to remember, relative to the president's budget, they try to reclassify a lot of their spending, such as the highway bill, into mandatory savings. So what it does is it makes the other mandatory look bigger and the discretionary number look smaller because the president tries to reclassify um, some spending from discretionary into mandatory. So that's, that, that's, a, that's an issue where I think the administration went the wrong way, but they're trying to sneak many more things under the autopilot side of government spending. As far as the tax rates are concerned, that is up to ways and means to decide which tax expenditures stay, which go, and what are the bend points within the income stream. No, you don't. I've, I've been writing tax reform bills for a long, long time. I participate in the Fiscal Commission. The Fiscal Commission says get rid of all of them, you can go down to 23 percent. We're talking about a, a rate that's even a little higher than that, which allows you to afford the accommodation of some of these expenditures. Weissman. Um, Club for Growth and some other conservatives have said that they will demand uh, balance in 10 years. Uh, you haven't done that. What is your response to them? Could it be done? Yes, it could be done. And under the right kind of economic growth scenarios, under what I think are more realistic scorekeeping, it is done. If you put this budget through what we think are much more reasonable projections of the economy, then that is accomplished. The, the issue is we, as the Budget Committee, must use the CBO baseline, the current law baseline. Here's the problem. CBO and their baseline assumes a $4 trillion tax increase starts in January. CBO therefore then assumes, rightfully, the economy goes down. But we have to use that baseline. So we have to, in writing our budget, use this baseline that assumes really bad economic policies, which we don't have in our budget, but unfortunately is baked into the yardstick that we must use to write our budget, which shows it takes a, long time, a longer time to balance. If you apply what we think are much more reasonable, academically backed up, you know, reinforced economic growth projections, then yes, absolutely, you can balance within that time frame. Yeah, um, Andrew. In responding to Laura, you kind of glossed over the other mandatory costs. I mean, yeah. the, the, the transportation, okay. I mean, that, I mean these, these are unlike anything you proposed last year. Are you going after food stamps, let me go, school lunches? Let me go into the detail then. We propose welfare reform round two. This is the Todd Rikita, Jim Jordan proposal, which says, let's take those principles of welfare reform that were extremely successful in getting people out of lives of dependency and back on their feet. That means block granting means-tested entitlements like food stamps, like housing assistance, back to the states so they can customize these benefits have time limits, work requirements, the kinds of successful policies that made welfare reform so successful. <coughs> we also propose agricultural reform, get savings from that, where we don't propose to have as much spending in the agriculture side, uh, commodity side of the bill. That means crop insurance, direct payment reform. We also propose uh, federal employee reform, where we think that federal workers should have to pay, um, you know, half of their pension um, themselves instead of having the private sector taxpayers pay for all of it. So. You know, there's about 100 pages here of details, which are 
food stamp reform, welfare reform, federal employee reform, agriculture reform. I can go on and on on the list, but that's the, the, the bulk of where those savings come from. Uh, that's, we, that's not part of this. Uh, you yeah. mentioned crop insurance. Uh, crop insurance has been cut $12 billion in two tranches already. And most of the folks who are working on this right now say crop insurance is the key to reducing spending on those other programs that you mentioned in agriculture. Why go after crop insurance? Because that's going to be the core of the farm we're, we're asking the authorizers, the agriculture committee, to decide exactly how to do this. They're going to have to save, I think it's $33 billion. Um, direct payments, crop insurance, all of the area within the ag title is what the authorizing committee, the Chairman Lucas, will have to come up with. But do I think, this is me talking, do I think you can get more reform out of crop insurance subsidies? Yes, I do. I also think the bulk of the savings um, need to come from direct, uh, from, uh, direct payments, but that is up to the Agriculture Dis Committee to decide exactly how they do that. Talking, yeah. how, how much does your plan save Medicare? Um, our plan saves Medicare from bankruptcy over the long term. In the 10-year window, um, th these benefits do not change for people, as I mentioned, 55 and above. But we do propose uh, medical liability reform, which saves Medicare. By repealing Obamacare, you save some spending in Medicare. And we also agree with the President in his budget on the need to means test, um, more means testing in, throughout the Medicare program. We put that in here as well. I can't remember off the top of my head what those savings are. It's, in the, it's on our table. Chairman Ryan, Chairman Ryan, Chairman Ryan. Chairman Ryan. Yeah, yeah. follow up on Luke's question. Uh, do you see this? Do you see this budget, the issues in this budget, as the central issue in the coming campaign? And do you expect the Republican nominee for President to be campaigning on this budget? I expect the Republican nominee, whoever this person is, to offer the country the legitimate choice that they deserve. The president and his party are ignoring this problem. And if we have a debt crisis, then the people who get hurt the first and the worst are the poor and the elder. We will be cutting indiscriminately, just like they're doing in Greece. We have a moral and a legal obligation to budget, to show how we will prevent this debt crisis, this most predictable crisis, from coming. And so, yes, I expect our nominee, whoever he is, to talk about how he proposes to fix this problem. We have an obligation in the House because we're in the majority. We're still the minority party in America, but in the House we have the majority. So we're putting out our path to prosperity. We're going to show the country here is an alternative path to the one that the President has us on. This is a path that we believe reignites and renews the American idea. It reclaims the opportunity society with a safety net, which we do believe must exist for people who cannot help themselves, for people who are down in the luck so they can get back on their feet. But we don't want to turn this safety net into a hammock that lulls able-bodied people into lives of dependency and complacency, that drains them of their will and their incentive to make the most of their lives. So yes, we are sharpening the contrast between the path that we're proposing and the path to debt and decline that the President has placed us upon. And yes, we do believe that our nominee, whoever this, this person is going to be, is going to be perfectly consistent with this. I've spoken to all of these guys. And they believe that we are heading in the right direction. On this vote, the yeas are 227, the nays are 172, and the question of consideration is decided in the affirmative. Without an objection, a motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. The gentleman from Utah is recognized for one hour. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For purposes of debate only, I yield the customary 30 minutes to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Slaughter, pending which I yield myself such time as I may consume. During, cons during consideration of this resolution, all time yielded is for the purpose of debate only, and I further ask that all members have five legislative days in which to revise and extend their remarks. Without objection. Resolution provides for a modified open rule for the consideration of H.R. 2087, a bill to remove certain restrictions from a parcel of land that's situated in the Atlantic District of Accomack County in Virginia. It provides for one hour of general debate equally divided and controlled by the chairman and ranking minority member of the Committee on Natural Resources. This rule makes in order all amendments that were pre-printed in the congressional record and which otherwise comply with the rules of the House. So this modified rule is a very fair rule. It is a generous rule. It will provide for a balanced and open debate on the merits of this bill that is not an earmark. And I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from Utah reserves.
the purpose of the gentlelady from New York, Secret Commission. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. I thank the gentleman from Utah, my colleague, Mr. Bishop, for yielding me the customary 30 minutes and yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlelady is recognized. Thank you. We begin yet another week of inaction in the House of Representatives. Last week, Mr. Speaker, could we have order? House will be in order. Last week, our colleagues in the Senate, working together in a bipartisan fashion, approved a transportation bill that would be the biggest job creation measure this body has considered in this Congress. But are we talking about a bipartisan job creation bill in the House? No. Instead of creating thousands of jobs through a bipartisan transportation bill we, uh, that uh, has already passed the Senate, as we said, it's, and just waits our action, we are talking about an $800,000 earmark to benefit a single county in a single state. And if somebody talked about the day's work that we were getting around to, this is it. In other words, Instead of creating the millions of new jobs that would result from a strong bipartisan transportation bill, we're spending the entire day debating a bill that affects 32 acres of land in a single state. No other community in America has received the kind of special treatment that is provided to a single community in this bill. This earmark hardly seems like a fiscally responsible way to create jobs and to protect the tax dollars of our hardworking American uh, citizens. This is not the first time the federal government has had to make decisions about transferring public lands to new issues, uses. Excuse me. Fortunately, there is an established procedure in existing law to ensure that the taxpayers get just compensation in such cases. We are being asked today to ignore that. Instead of letting the National Park Service and the local community handle the transfer of this land in the tried and true way, the majority proposes making a one-time exception, an $8,000, $100,000 earmark for this single community. If this majority was serious about job creation, we would be right now discussing the Senate passed transportation bill. But instead, as I said before, we spend an entire day of this week debating 32 acres of land. And I urge my colleagues to vote no on the rule, the underlying legislation, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady from New York reserves. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Mr. Speaker, I am very pleased to yield. How much time do you want? How much time? Two, three minutes? I'm pleased to yield four minutes to the uh, sponsor of this bill, who will once again try to describe to this body how this county land should stay with the county and needs to be dealt with by the county, and all we have to do is reserve, remove an unnecessary restriction on its deed. And with that, I recognize the gentleman from Virginia for four minutes. The gentleman from Virginia is recognized for four minutes. I thank the gentleman uh, from uh, Utah, uh, Mr. Speaker. It's a real pri privilege today to speak on behalf of the bill that I'm introducing. Uh, it is indeed a jobs bill. It is a, a bill that reflects common sense. It's a bill that reflects common ground. And I think importantly, it reflects the wisdom and the will of the good, hardworking residents of Accomack County and Virginia, which I have the privilege of representing. It enjoyed uh, bipartisan support in coming out of committee, and it enjoys and should enjoy and merits today uh, bipartisan support when it uh, comes to before the full house for a vote. Here's why, if it's passed, it will uh, work toward job creation. Unlike so many measures that uh, some have proposed, instead of looking to Washington to actually spend more money or, or for Washington to do something, the folks of Accomack County are simply asking for the federal government to get out of the way and allow the greatest job-producing engine the world's ever known, Mr. Speaker, the American entrepreneur, to go forward and to put hard-working folks to work and put precious and limited capital to work. This bill simply removes a deed restriction. A deed restriction, that's all it does. And this deed restriction is, in effect, a restriction on job creation. It's a restriction on much needed tax revenue that this county so desperately needs. 16% unemployment, 16% uh, of the folks there are living uh, the poverty level. 
Accomack County is 90 percent agriculture, agri agricultural, uh, a bit of tourism, and then the, the NASA Wallops facility. This piece of property is adjacent to the NASA Wallops facility, and presently, with this deed restriction, they can't use it at all for any economic growth or opportunity. Removing this deed restriction will allow the, uh, the Board of Supervisors there to move forward with their Wallops Research Park. They are desperate to get this done, and I'm ready to help them today. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as I mentioned earlier, this bill enjoyed bipartisan support in committee. It does not require any money coming from the federal government. We're simply asking for the federal government to get out of the way and let the hardworking folks of Accomack County get on with job creation. So I yield back to my friend from Utah, and I thank him for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the bill. The gentleman yield back. back. The gentleman from Utah Reserves, the gentleman from, or general lady from New York is recognized. Um, I, I just wish to make a comment or two. Uh, this, the most unusual thing about this bill is that when we have a federal land swap and a deed that goes with it, they're always the same. You can use this land for public purposes. Should you decide not to use this land for public purposes, it reverts to the government. It's as simple as that. So what we're doing now is giving away $800,000 that belongs to my constituents, your constituents, everybody else's constituents. We're giving away the tax money. Um, and I've got a good idea because there's a Democrat amendment today that can remedy that. And it says the county can pay for the land with the revenues they get from developing the land and renting it out. So that way we'll get our money back. The county should be very happy. And we hope that a lot of jobs are created there. Uh, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlelady from New York reserves. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. I reserve. The gentleman from Utah reserves. May I inquire, Mr. Speaker, if my colleague is ready to close? Gentleman from Utah. I'd be more than happy to close at any time you're ready. I am ready. The gentlelady from New York is recognized. In closing today, let me reiterate what I've said all along. This is not a jobs bill. It does nothing to put millions of unemployed Americans back to work. By considering this bill, the majority made decision that it's more important to vote on an earmark than to vote on a transportation bill that would create thousands of jobs, perhaps a million throughout the United States, and had strong bipartisan support. And we must do something because, as we know, the current legislation will expire at the end of this month. If the House passes today's legislation, we will have taken a vote and we will not have helped the American people. We all know we were not sent here to avoid solving the pressing problems facing our constituents, and we certainly weren't sent here to spend our days giving away public land so one county and one state could receive a windfall while all the rest of the taxpayers get nothing. I urge my colleagues to get back to the single biggest problem facing the country, the lack of jobs, and to vote on the bipartisan Senate transportation bill, which easily passed the Senate 74 to 22. Until we do, we are just trading water. As our roads and bridges and highways crumble and our constituents are neglected, I urge my colleagues to vote no on today's rule and the underlying legislation, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlelady from New York yields back the balance of her time. The gentleman from Utah is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I am very pleased to speak in favor of the underlying bill. The gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Riggle, knows his constituents, he knows the needs there, and has worked very hard for their benefit. This, as we already discussed and voted, is not an earmark. The gentlelady from New York introduced a heritage area for Niagara Falls that got $10 million sent from the federal government to that place. That was officially not an earmark. This bill has no money going anywhere. The land is the county's, no exchange of profit whatsoever. There is no earmark. There is no money being exchanged. This land was originally Virginia's land. They gave it to the federal government for a federal purpose. 36 years ago, the federal government, no longer needing the land, gave it back to this county for a public park. 
as a public park, it is useless. Now that's the common bond here. It is not needed as a park, it is not used as a park, there is no parking, it is inaccessible, it is lousy for that purpose. The county, though, would like to use their land to do economic development because that is where it is and for what it would best be used, how it would help the public and the general good if it was used for economic development. And all they need is the federal government to graciously grant a deed restriction which they refuse to do for whatever purpose, no one really knows. But they won't do it. That is why the county needs to keep the county land to do something that is common sense. Simply use the land for the purpose in which it best suits the needs of the people. And I don't know why the Department of Interior, in its infinite wisdom, decides they want to tell the county in Virginia what is best for Virginia, but that is exactly what they are trying to do by being hard-nosed, not on a law, but on an internal rule from the Department of Interior. Look, this government already controls one out of every three acres in this nation. That's one-third of America is controlled by the federal government. That means the federal government's inholdings are larger than any country in the world with the exception of Russia and Canada. That's what we already have. And yet the Department of Interior is straining over 32 acres that shouldn't be a park and need to be used to help the people of this particular county, and that simply is illogical. It is irrational. I have faced this similar circumstances in countless bills that we have had and passed before this body. There was public land in the middle of Park City in my district that was belonging to the control by the Bureau of Land Management. They didn't need it. They didn't want it. They didn't use it. It was actually being occupied by squatters. The city had no control over it because it was public land, and yet the Department of Interior did not want to, de to, de to let go of that land because the control was already there. We passed another bill earlier that went through the House and the Senate the transferred land that the Forest Service had in Mandaway that they didn't even know they had. We had to do a title search to remind them, oh yeah, that actually is ours. They didn't need it, they didn't want it, they didn't use it, and after six years we finally got them to, to give it up so it could be used for a better purpose. We have another bill for two acres in Alta that the Park Service doesn't want to give up for whatever reason, even though on that building, on that two acres, there is already the city building, a public, uh, uh, a public safety building, and public bathrooms for the community and those that go to that ski resort. And yet the, part, the Forest Service in this case doesn't want to give that up for whatever reason there may be. You know, Mr. Speaker, we were just in a hearing earlier this morning that dealt with a proposed Eisenhower Memorial. In all due respect, I just recently read a, a biography of Eisenhower. When he was, I believe he was just a lieutenant in the Army, he had his first child and he applied for and received permission for a housing increase that he thought he deserved and so did the, uh, the commanding officer who approved that housing increase. A little while later they did an audit and the acting inspector general did an audit and found out that there was a technicality to which General Eisenhower was not entitled to that housing increase. When he was confronted with that he immediately said he apologized and said oh he was more than willing to pay back the $250.67 that he owed the government. But that wasn't good enough for the Inspector General. That acting Inspector General wanted a court-martial because that was what the rules were. That acting Inspector General had this blind fetish for fealty to follow rules because that's what, in, that's what bureaucrats always want to do. Fortunately, there was a commanding officer that realized in this young army officer a talent and an ability and they intervened and allowed General, but then Lieutenant Eisenhower simply to pay the $250.67 and get on with it. It is amazing to consider what this nation and what this world would be like if Lieutenant Eisenhower had actually been court-martialed over $250.67 because that was the rule. We have the same situation, 32 acres that is useless right now. It has no purpose. It sits there. And the federal government wants to deny a county in Virginia the ability to do something useful to help people on 32 acres because it violates their internal rule. There has to be some time when common sense 
takes over and we actually do things because it's the right thing to do, because it is the better thing to do. Fortunately, there was, a, there was an officer in Texas that realized in the case of General Eisenhower, common sense should take over. It would be nice, it would be wonderful if within the Department of Interior there was some element of common sense that said it is stupid what we are doing with this land. We need simply to use common sense and use the land for a better, better purpose. There is no transfer of land. The county has it. If we don't pass this bill, the county will still have it. They just can't use it effectively. If we pass this bill, there will be no transfer of money. All you're telling is the county can use the county's land to do something the county needs to help the people in that county. And honestly, should not that be our goal? Is that not our purpose, to actually use common sense or do we have the bureaucratic blood running through our veins that we put these little blinders on and unless we check the right box, it doesn't matter if it helps, it doesn't matter if it's good, it doesn't matter if it's possible, we won't do it because of our internal rules. That is indeed where this country and this Congress has come. There is something definitely wrong with us. This rule is a fair rule. It will provide for a good debate provides all those amendments that were pre-printed and are in order to be debated here on the floor. Let us proceed forward with this bill. Let's help this county that desperately needs our help and desperately needs us just to use some good old-fashioned common sense and vote yes on this amendment. I, uh, I have to say something first before. That's it. I am ready now to yield back the balance of my time after I move the previous question on this resolution. Back. Without objection, the previous question is ordered. The question is on adoption of the resolution. All those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no.